Hi, Dr. Bill here. It's another one of our newsletter video blogs. And this one is a bit of a hot potato. And I wasn't sure whether I wanted to get involved with this or not. But um, perhaps against my better judgment, here goes. We'll see what happens. Because so I do want to make a positive contribution uh, to the, um, the problem that the world's facing at the moment with the coronavirus. So depending on when you actually get uh, to watch this, uh, it will have a more or less, uh, have a greater or less impact for you. So as the title suggests, what I'm going to talk to you about could be what I feel is the most overlooked solution to the problem of the coronavirus. And to give you a clue of what that, that solution could be, I'm going to ask you a question, get you to do some work. What do you think could be the common denominator or the common factor in the fact of all those that are most susceptible, maybe not all of them, but most of those that are the most susceptible to the coronavirus? The elderly, for instance, uh, those that may have a compromised immune system, they may be struggling with an autoimmune disease, they may be on auto-suppressant uh, medication, um, so you know things like cancer, uh, lupus, and rheumatoid arthritis, etc, etc, even irritable bowel syndrome. So um, those that are overstressed, and even to some degree, uh, maybe not to all, but to some degree, those that may be institutionalized in some way, those that are in prisons, so those that may be in nursing homes, apart from the, the fact that, um, you know, they're all in a, a large group. And of course, with the, those in nursing homes, they're elderly. So think about what could be the common denominator, common denominator of those groups of people. So uh, what I'm also going to do is to talk to you about my seven tips as to what you can do to either prevent or either treat uh, an infectious uh, or an infection when you get one. So we'll, we'll get through that and we'll move along. So um, I don't want to go over the, the ground that's already been gone over uh, well enough uh, by governments and those that have that responsibility for managing this problem. Uh, such things as you know how you prevent your likelihood or your risk of the coronavirus, obviously washing your hands thoroughly, uh, regularly, um, avoiding you know, touching surfaces that may be being touched by a lot of other people, uh, you know, coughing into your elbow, uh, into your elbow, not in your hand. Uh, so, you know, things like that, which you can basically get anywhere. That's not my purpose of doing this. Uh, the other thing I won't be discussing a lot of, of course, is the symptoms. Um, coronavirus is a respiratory infection, and it's very similar to the MERS and the SARS virus, which are all coronaviruses, um, which I'll get to in just a moment. So you have obviously such things as a cough, particularly a dry cough. You can get a fever, you can get fatigue. Um, you know, the, the typical flu-like symptoms. So uh, so you may get those and it may not be coronavirus. Now, uh, in my view and in the view of a lot of people, there's a, this has been, there's a lot of panic and a lot of fear that's been uh, created or uh, caused by... Um, the way this has been. I'm not going to blame the media, I don't want to beat them up, but let's just make that general statement that there has been a lot of fear and a lot of panic. People have reacted to this in a way that uh, they've never reacted for a long time um, that I'm aware of, that I can remember. You know, we hear all stories about being going, people going crazy in the supermarkets, nothing left on the shelves. <laughs> no toilet paper, I mean, it's cr I know it's crazy. So that's the fear and the panic that I, I wanted to address a little bit. See, fear and panic are actually very stressful for the body. 
And ironically enough, the more stressed you are, the more likely you have of contracting an infectious disease like the coronavirus. So it's, it's, it's like fueling the problem in one way. So I wanted to kind of um, take some of that panic uh, and that fear, uh, allay some of that uh, with uh, my listeners uh, and my followers. So we'll, we'll, get, we'll get to that in a moment. So um, there has been a response to this like you know, no one's ever seen. So uh, to do that, to, to try and allay some of that, I want to um, use some comparisons of other infectious diseases. I want to use some statistics. Now, statistics, uh, they're a, a strange animal because you can kind of use them to, you know, uh, prove anything you want almost. So keep that in mind. Now, a lot of the statistics talk about um, the incidence. In other words, how many people contract the coronavirus. Now, as with a lot of viruses, um, you can have no symptoms at all, but still be carrying the virus. You can have mild symptoms. You can have moderate symptoms. You can have severe symptoms. And you can have even death. So there's a whole range of symptoms that you can get. And, and what they do is they talk about the, the number of deaths uh, from those that actually contract the virus, which is kind of like, to me, it's not the complete picture. It's part of it. But it's not the complete picture. So what I what I wanted to do is look at the total total number of deaths per population, if you like, not based on how many people contract the virus. So um, the flu virus, for instance, in the last twelve months or so, particularly during the flu season in the in the Western Hemisphere, which is the winter when the, the flu is at its worst. Do you know how many people died of the flu virus, the influenza virus, compared to how many has died at present. At the moment, as of making this recording, which is the 20th of March, uh, 2020, as of this recording, um, the latest statistics, which I checked them first, is approximately uh, 200,000 people worldwide affected by the coronavirus and 8,000 deaths which is about 4%, but the, the, the estimate is of those that contract the virus, the death rate is 3.4%. And we'll get to the other statistics in a moment. But the flu virus, to compare the two, the flu virus um, in the last 12 months or so, particularly through the winter season in the Western Hemisphere, there were 500,000 deaths from the flu virus, and we don't think a bit. We don't think a thing about it. We don't even worry about it. Yeah, we may get our flu shot. We may not get our flu shot, and it it doesn't doesn't seem to affect our way of life. Yet, look at what's happening now. Now, admittedly, the difference between the um, the coronavirus and the other viruses that we're talking about is the unknown factor. So you know, I I take that point, and that's what the authorities are concerned about. And they're doing the best to contain it because they don't know how virulent or how severe it's going to be. And so all these steps that they're taking are good. There's nothing wrong with that. But I think the public uh, have actually overreacted for whatever reason. And that's why I'm trying to allay that and make, some, uh, make a difference. So as I said, the number of deaths from the flu has been in the last year, just one year, approximately, is, and of course the figures do vary, and I'm approximating, half a million, 500,000. Now we talked about the SARS virus. The SARS, I think was about 10 years ago, when the SARS virus was uh, on the, on the uh, landscape. Um, but it's gone now. And that SARS stands for se Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. Syndrome. So we talk, we said it is a coronavirus, and that actually killed, um, I think uh, it was about eight, yeah, 800. It killed about 800 people. Okay, we've got 8,000 on the coronavirus. This is the SARS virus. But the, the, 
the interesting thing about the SARS virus is that for those that contracted it, about 10% died. So you can see in one way that's more severe, in one way, that if you got the SARS virus, you, if, the chance of dying from it was 10%, which is bit bigger than 3.4. The MERS virus, which was the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, 34% of people died from that. So if you got that, your likelihood was one in three. And about, I think it was about 900 died of that. And of course, the corona, as we mentioned, the likelihood of you dying, if you get that, is 3.4%. But again, remember, um, not everybody has the same percentage of risk. You have to be in the high risk factor as well. So uh, hopefully by creating that perspective, um, it will help you to minimize your fear and minimize, uh, help you to um, reduce your stress so you don't become more susceptible. So what do you think then is that common factor, that common denominator that could exist in those that are more susceptible to the coronavirus? Well, I think from my view, it's ill health. So you might, you might be thinking, oh, what? Yeah, ill health. The more unhealthy you are, the more likely you are to contract any virus. The more healthy you are, the least likely good you are. And that to me is so simple, so profound, and yet it's often overlooked. I haven't heard it mentioned in all of the, the news media and all everything that's going on. I've not mentioned about the, the need to, to be healthy. That's the greatest form of resistance you can have. Yes, it takes work. Yes, it takes sacrifice. Yes, it takes effort. It takes all of those things. But, you know, that's the nature of the beast. And so you have a choice. You can either prepare and get yourself healthy so your risk factor is much, much lower. So um, I'm, <laughs> without going too far, I'm, I guess, considered uh, in the risk factor age but I don't consider myself at risk at all. I'm not concerned about it at all. I very, very rarely get uh, a problem. I very rarely get the flu, despite despite what I've been through, um, because I work at staying healthy. That's important to me for various reasons. Okay. Now, I want to talk about my my seven tips for actually helping to prevent and or treat uh, any particular infection in the body, viral, bacterial, coronavirus, whatever. Uh, now, obviously, these are my suggestions, and uh, hopefully they're not taken out of context or saying that I can cure the coronavirus. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying these are my tips that I think will actually help prevent, pardon me, or treat uh, virtually any infectious disease. Maybe there's some exceptions to that, but um, be that as it may. Okay, number one, and this is that might surprise some of you, the number one in on my list is detoxification. Now, I've been in practice for over 40 years, and I've seen a lot of things, and I've used a lot of things. And detoxification, for me, is very, very powerful for many conditions. And I do have a webinar, which goes for about 50 minutes or so, which you can watch, which gives you a lot more information. So I'm just touching on the subject here. So I suggest you go to my website and look at the at drbilldeverson.com and look at the webinar on detoxification so you can get uh, more of the information. So the whole idea of toxification is to eliminate as many impurities um, from your body as possible. So you give less for the infectious, the infectious organisms to feed on. So a clean body is a healthy body uh, and it makes it uh, less likelihood that you're going to contract some of these infectious diseases. So uh, putting it simply and shortly when you detox, the whole idea is to do um, a detox program, which um, my advice is to do two things. One is you just, and I, I'm 
not a great believer in doing water fasts. Uh, if you can do it, great. Nothing wrong with that. But it is quite severe and it's not for the faint-hearted and not for everybody. So if you can do water fast, that's fine. So what I recommend is what I call a, a fruit and vegetable cleanse. Where you eat nothing but fruit and vegetables for as long as you can up to about a week. Now, even if you just do one day on fruit and vegetables, it'll still make a difference. Two days is more, three days is even greater. You do a whole week, if you can do that, then the difference will astound you. But certainly, two to three days will have a, a very profound effect. And when I say fruit and vegetables, I don't mean fruit juice. There's too much sugar in fruit juice. So the fruit themselves, or the fruit without juicing them, um, and vegetables with um, not, non, not a lot or no starchy veggies, potato, pumpkin, sweet potato, carrots, because the starch, which is converted by the body to sugar. So um, minimize, minimize your starchy vegetables. So fruit eaten as it is, uh, vegetables can be either eaten raw, cooked, juiced, or souped. So, um, and you don't mix your fruit and vegetables together, ideally, some exceptions to that. So you can do a, a juice cleanse. Um, and if you go onto my, again, my website, the type in uh, juicing, you'll, you'll see a section in there on, on uh, how to juice. So fruit and vegetables for anywhere from one to seven or eight days, depending on your uh, capability. What I usually recommend too is that if you only do one day, do one day a week. So it's like one day for every every seven. So you do one day a week and then if possible you can do two days once you're used to it and you get your body used to detoxing so it's not just a you don't get a, a severe healing crisis where everything starts to detox all at once and it becomes too hard for you. So you do a, a detox um, one day for every seven so you could do two days for every two weeks, three days for every three weeks, four days for every four weeks, etc. So you get the idea. So you can build up to it gradually. Now once you've done a, a, a seven day cleanse, I'm not saying you should do one every seven or eight weeks, I'm not saying that. It's just when you're building up to it. You probably only need to do that a couple of times a year. Unless of course, now we're talking about prevention here as well as treating. I'm not going to use the word cure, okay, deliberately. I might get myself, I get myself into trouble. A lot of restrictions now on what you can and can't say. So I have to try and uh, make sure I abide by the rules. Okay, no more on that. Um, so we've got, um, <laughs> oh boy, uh, <laughs> I've got to go back to the subject. Okay, so... Um, Right, uh, so one day for, for, for every week, if you can do that. Now, for prevention, now get back on track, for either prevention or treating of you know, any, in any, anything that's wrong with you, with some exceptions, of course. It's important, really, to also keep your bowel open uh, because your bowel is your sewage department. You've got to make sure you, know, you, you keep your bowel open, and there are various things you can do. Now, I mentioned two things with detoxing. The other, the second one is taking certain herbal products that will actually contribute to the detoxing, cleanse the liver, the bowel, etc., etc. So on my website, you'll see more information. We have a basic cleanse, then we have an advanced cleanse where one is two products, another one is four products that you can use. Now, if you just do the cleanse without the products, that will be still helpful and useful. If you just do the products, Without the cleanse, that will still help too. So you can do one or the other, but obviously you get must much better effect if you do two together, especially with the uh, advanced cleanse. So that's detoxification. Uh, move on to tip number two. Uh, this is an interesting one, which again might surprise you a little bit. Uh, they even recommend this in on some of the websites for the coronavirus. And drink lots of water. Now, I know you've heard this a lot of time, but your water is, is your flushing agent. It helps to cleanse your body, flush all the impurities out. Now, more is not always best. So everybody is different. 
you can actually you can actually have too much water. Okay, uh, that's it. Just lost my picture. Um, so more is not necessarily better uh, when we test uh, when we test patients for how much they need. It's usually in about between one to two liters. So now some people do have difficulty drinking a lot of water, and I get that. I understand that. So when it comes to water, if you you can always cheat a little bit. Uh, ideally, it needs to be water because you know, put things in it, and then it, it it reduces the effectiveness. But if you have trouble drinking the water, there could be a reason for that. So what we what I'm going to suggest is you can do all of these things, or one of these things. Just play around with it. Just whatever whatever works best for you. So what you can do is actually do one quarter sparkling apple juice, three quarters water. That helps you, uh, it has the sparkling apple juice, has the potassium. You can even put a little pinch of salt in there, which adds the sodium, and that actually becomes a rehydration drink. So it's important to put the uh, electrolytes back into your body. So doing that little trick, the quarter sparkling apple juice, or the less sparkling apple juice you put in there, the better. The, spark, the little bit of uh, sparkle in there, Okay, the area it's the water and it makes it a lot easier to assimilate. What I also advise if you have a glass of that, then follow it with actually a glass of water, and you'll find it's actually easier to, to get the water down. You can also add to the water if you want a little bit of lemon uh, juice, uh, even a little bit of mint. And if the lemon's a little bit too tart for you, put a little bit of vitamin C powder. You can also add a, a teaspoon of chlorophyll. So there's all these things you can add in to make it more effective. But whenever you have this rehydration drink, you should always follow it with a glass of water. So you're still getting the water in. So the water is important. Now, not all water is created equal. And again, you go to my website, look up, look up deuterium, D-E-U, if I'm spelling it right, D-E-U-T-R-I-U-M, deuterium, D-E-R-I-U-M, deuterium depleted water. And if you look up that, you'll find that, that um, some water is better than another. Now, I'm, not a great, I'm not a great fan of tap water because of all the impurities already in it, but any water is better than none. So I believe it's better if you can either filter or purify or buy spring water uh, to drink. It's a great medicine. It's the cheapest, best medicine we have. So I definitely recommend the water. But a few tips there on how to uh, uh, assimilate the water and have it work better for you. Now, the number three in our prevention and treatment uh, tips is exercise. Now, obviously, exercise is much better when you are healthy or when you're not sick because you can do a lot more. But when you are sick, then you have to be very, very careful depending on how sick you are. So you have to be moderate and sensible and prudent in how much exercise you do, because if you do too much, even whether you're well, it can stress, it can stress, put stress on your immune system. And there's many examples of athletes that have gotten sick from overexercise because they overtrained and stressed their immune system, made them more prone to getting sick. So exercise, if you're going to do it for your health, then you need to be sensible in how you do that. It is easy to overtrain and be counterproductive to your health with the exercise. Different if you're exercising because you're in a competition or because you love what you do or you love doing 35k runs and half marathons and all that sort of thing. You know, if that's your love and that's your passion, well, you pay the price. You, know, you just do that. So it's not all bad. Okay. Now, I'm a great believer of two in rebound exercise on a mini trampoline. So no matter how sick you are, you can get on a mini trampoline and just slowly move up and down. And what that does helps to get movement in your body, helps to get movement in your lymphatic system, your venous system, get your circulation going, uh, helps your body cleanse. So exercising on a mini trampoline, especially when you're sick, just gentle, is probably ideal. So you have to be measurable when you're not well as to how much exercise you do. Just going for a short um, casual walk when you're not well can be helpful too as long as you don't go for too far. 
So just just be sensible. I won't I won't go into too much detail on that. Just uh, I think that's enough to to share with you the importance of it. Okay, so we've got next one in our list is diet. Uh, again, prevention and treatment. So healthy diet, similar to the cleansing, the more fruit and vegetables you eat, the better, and the less rubbish you put into your body, the less sugary, uh, refined, carbohydrate, bad fatty foods you put into your body, they're the three categories, sugary, refined carbs, white flour, etc., um, bad fats, etc. Uh, now, some people are, um, you know, the vegan revolution is here, so everyone's sort of into the vegan and, and I have nothing against that. What I'm a, a great believer in is that you have to find out what's best for your body. Some people do need meat for their metabolism. Uh, they need to have it. Now, I'm not saying you should have a lot of meat, but some people do need it. Obviously, the less the better, but some people do need that, that meat. So, But uh, as a prevention, you make sure you, you avoid all those things that are going to It'll require a lot of digesting and a lot of elimination because that puts a lot of strain on the body. Cheese is a prime example. Cheese is a great food for what it contains, same as red meat, but it requires a lot of digestion and a lot of work to eliminate. And often, you know, they contain impurities as well. So uh, just be sensible with your diet. When you're sick, then your diet is even more important that you don't put what I call heavy heavy foods in there. Uh, we already mentioned what you do with detoxing. Very similar when you're sick, just to try and you know eat fruit and vegetables uh, as best you can. And you can always you know uh, chicken soup or uh, other type of soup that's got the the chicken or the the beef ground up, so you're getting all the flavour and all the benefit in the soup. But it's kind of like in a sense pre-digested, and that's that's what a juice is, a vegetable juice. Fruit is digested you know, virtually within 30 minutes so, 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 because it's mostly water. Whereas uh, vegetables, a vegetable juice, there's virtually no digestion required, very little, and no elimination. So it's a very, very uh, high ratio of uh, the value you get out of it for what you have to put in to get it. Okay, uh, next on our hit list, uh, tip number five is stress. Now, I suppose in one way, and I'm biased in this, I admit, stress is probably the biggest one for me, because I see it so often in my practice. I mean, it's been estimated, the figures vary, but 80 to 90 percent of all you know, stress contributes to about 80, 90 percent of most of our physical problems. So it's a biggie, um, but it's a toughie because we live in a very stressful world. And it's also insidious. That means we're not always aware of how much stress we have. And it's also cumulative, which means it builds up. It's not just the stress you had today, or this week, or this month. It's what's been happening for years. So stress does have a, an accumulative effect, an insidious effect. So you have to learn to relax, to unwind, to de-stress, uh, to meditate, to switch off, to do all of those things that actually help your body to uh, get out of the fight or flight uh, routine, the fight or flight uh, treadmill. And there's reasons for that now. Um, your, your body basically has two primary functions. One, and the, mainly to keep you alive, survival of the species. So it's what your, your genes are designed to do, to keep you alive. And that, that we divide that into two areas. One is called uh, protection, protection from fear or danger or threat, and also growth. That is, you know, your health of your body, your normal functions in your body. But the body is unable to 
place all of its resources into both of those at the same time. Uh, the body is able to shunt or move its resources from one to the other depending on your need. And with uh, threat or perceived threat in your subconscious, that can keep your body mobilized in the fight or flight part of your mechanism at the expense of your health and your growth mechanisms, which is why stress can undermine your immune system, because in your subconscious, whether you're aware of it or not, you're waiting for the next problem to occur. So um, I'm just touching on the stress. It's a big area. Again, go to my website. You'll find a webinar on that, and there's a lot of information on stress, how you can deal with that. Okay, um, six tip number six and tip number seven. I'm going to combine those a little bit because the, it's, it's simpler and easier, which you'll see why as we go. So number six, tip number six is nutrition. Unfortunately, with our diet or our foods today, they don't always contain what they should. I know a lot of people saying, okay, you should get everything you need from your food or your diet. And that's true, you should, but we don't because it doesn't always contain it. And that's why we need to supplement, there's the word supplement, uh, our diet with things that we may be deficient in. So it's all about, even if you go to a medical textbook, Guyton, when I studied over 40 years ago, it had a whole section in there on nutritional deficiencies. And yet it's like, it's ignored. Yeah, here it is in the physical, physiological medical textbook talking about if you have a deficiency of vitamin C, you're going to get scurvy or deficiency of B vitamins, this can happen, etc., etc. Anyway, um, I digress slightly, only slightly. So coming back to the point, so good nutrition is paramount. Finding out what you may be deficient in is also important. And you can take a multivitamin, that's fine. You can take a, a super green powder, which has lots of nutrients in it. You can take something called colloidal minerals, colloidal trace minerals. So there's a couple of supplements that you can take that I think will cover a lot of the bases. One of them is a super green powder. We've got one on our website which you can look at. Another one is the colloidal trace minerals, which we also are on our website. To me, those are the two most important things you can put into your body unless you have a, a, a really specific deficiency. That's different. But generally speaking, a good quality green powder and a good quality colloidal trace mineral product um, will actually go a long way to helping you prevent getting a lot of these sicknesses and illnesses. And maybe if you want to throw in a, a good multivitamin too and any deficiencies that you might have. Now, uh, another a goodie for me is cod liver oil, which is an oldie, but it's a goodie. Uh, and I often prescribe it because cod liver oil is very good for the lungs. Hello. And it's uh, got, uh, it's quite rich in vitamin A. So cod liver oil, it's very, very cheap. Uh, you know, a couple of capsules a day. i tell you a funny story. When our children were little, we've had a big family. We used to give our children cod liver oil capsules. And we couldn't believe how well our children were taking these cod liver oil capsules. You can't really taste them that much. I mean, cod liver oil is unpleasant. We couldn't believe them. And they would just say, yeah, okay. Anyway, months later... We found all these little cod liver oil capsules <laughs> secreted in all these little hydro hydro places under in plants and all sorts of things. <laughs> so uh, I, we never to this day figured out who was. Yeah, we had nine children. Okay, for those of you who don't know, we never discovered who it was. So whether it was all of them or one of them. So anyway, needless to say, just a, in a, another funny story digression. Okay, coming back. So that's nutrition, add that in, it's a good preventative, especially in the winter, especially in the, the season of infectious diseases. And we are coming up, it's March now, we're coming up to the winter, especially for the young ones. Make sure they don't hide them. <laughs> don't give them, don't give them the, the raw oil, they'll never get it down. And the, look, there, there's some really, really expensive uh, cod liver oils on the market as well, which is supposed to have, you know, better effects, and that may be true. I've not tested them, so I can't recommend them. 
And number se number seven as well, because we're, we're going to do both together, as I said, is when you're actually, not just the treatment, but the actual um, medicines or, or remedies that you're going to take uh, if you do uh, ha or you have contracted uh, some type of illness. So my main ones, and there are obviously more than this, but I'm just going to give you the main ones to keep it simple. Vitamin C is a big one for me. For prevention, half a teaspoon twice a day, mixed in juice. For treatment, double that, one teaspoon twice a day. And as I mentioned earlier, if you take too much vitamin C, you'll, you'll uh, I may have mentioned it, I can't remember. If you take too much vitamin C, you can actually get loose bowels. So that's how you know you've had too much. Now, there is a new product on the market, market called liposomal uh, vitamin C, uh, which is quite more powerful uh, than ordinary vitamin C, and it doesn't have the same uh, effect on the bowel. So that's something new. So if you really want to get the bee's knees, um, look for the liposomal vitamin C. And, I pref and this is usually liquid, um, but whether it's liquid or a powder, it's better than the tablets because you've got to take too many tablets to get the right amount of vitamin C in your body. So uh, vitamin C is a, obviously a controversial issue, but you can do your own research if you like. I'm just talking from personal experience, and that's, that's what I recommend. Uh, the second one on our number six and seven tip is colloidal silver. And we... We use a lot of that in our clinic we have for many, many years, and the results that we've had come back have been uh, very pleasing for that. For the, it doesn't work for everybody, and it doesn't work for any everything. Nothing does. But uh, the only thing about the colloidal silver, if you if your virus is at a really, um, or your bacterial infection is at a really advanced stage, the colloidal silver may not be strong enough. But it's great as a preventative, and it's great if you can take it in the early stages. So prevention, at least a teaspoon gargled in your mouth uh, twice a day. Uh, it's swallow. That's for respiratory uh, sinus or lung problems. You take the colloidal silver straight. If it's for a, a digestive problem where you wanted to get uh, through through into the body, into the bloodstream, into the di digestion, you can put it in a little bit of water and sometimes it works a bit better. So for treatment, you double that dose at least. So you'd be having at least two teaspoons, I would say, three times a day. You can go higher than that if you want, but that's my recommendation. Two teaspoons, three times a day. Whereas if you're just using a preventative, one teaspoon, two to three times a day, gargle and swallow, same with the when you're treating it, just gargle and swallow. Uh, the next one is eucalyptus oil. And some people often say to me, but isn't eucalyptus oil poisonous? It's got that on the bottle. Yes, that's a precaution. And I say, what do you think they put in eucalyptus lollies? Oh, so it all depends on the amount. So what I recommend is you just take your little finger, put it over the end of the bottle, Tip the bottle up, moisten the little finger, wipe the back of your tongue, wipe the front of your throat, wipe the back of your neck. Do that a couple of times a day with eucalyptus oil. That way you're actually breathing in the eucalyptus oil fumes into your lungs. What you can also do instead of, or as well as, is you can take some Vicks Vapor Rub or something similar, put a couple of extra drops of eucalyptus oil, Rub it on the chest and on the back, so you're breathing it in at night. You may not want to. Your partner may not want to sleep with you, but you know um, it's a price you got to pay. So now that can work as well. Or putting it in an oil burner, or a vaporizer, or something where you're actually getting uh, where you're breathing in the air um, laden with the eucalyptus uh, molecules at night. So that's the eucalyptus soil. Uh, now there are a number of different vitamin and herbal formulas on the market that you can use either for, for prevention or for treatment and there's some very good uh, Chinese herbal formulas uh, there's some Chinese herbs that have been researched to show their effectiveness on the influenza virus, the flu virus but 
that's uh, there and not, and I'm not making any claim with the coronavirus at all, because I've not had any experience and there's been no research done today because it's a, it's a brand new week. But you can, um, the way I see it, and again, I'm not making a claim here, the way I see it is that if it can work on one virus, it's quite likely to, uh, could be effective in another virus. So you can draw your own conclusions. But to get to those uh, other vitamin herbal specific formulas for the immune system or treating a problem, you have to talk to either your practitioner or your uh, health food store uh, proprietor or the naturopath there. So that's uh, come to the end of uh, this video blog. Uh, thank you for taking the time to watch. And I hope uh, what I've done will help you to be proactive uh, in looking after yourself and your loved ones and not reactive. So I look forward to seeing you on our next video blog and good luck with the coronavirus. See you soon. Bye.